Yay, welcome back to officially the last day of class this semester. This is it. It's over. We've come this far. I can't believe it's already, I don't know, beginning of May. Just like yesterday was 1st of February or whenever we started. And I wanted to thank you all for doing this. It was, uh, it was an awesome experience for me. I've learned a lot giving the class this semester. I, I hope you got something out of it too. Uh, but thank you for you know challenging me and so on and giving me a good time and, and something to work towards um we've i've had a lot of fun i think i've had a lot of fun look at all the stuff we did over the course of a semester there's an entire youtube channel filled with lectures and there's readings and things like this on the website all kinds of useful things the videos have been watched by hundreds of people, unique viewers already. Like we're making a difference. We're helping students, you know, who knows where? Like, I don't even know. I have no idea who's watching these, but we're making a difference. We're helping people. Uh, I, I feel great about what we were able to achieve this semester. Was it perfect? Of course not, uh, but hopefully it was useful. So I want to thank you for everything you've done and wish you um, Good luck with research and, and everything else and hope to see you in other classes or around the department in the future. And we're, I'm handing this off to you then for the last meeting we have as a group uh, for the last set of presentations for today. So who's first? I could do it if you want. Uh, share screen. This one. All right, so let me blow everybody up quick. I've almost gotten used to doing this. All right. Um, this is my final project presentation for this class. Uh, my final project is the design of a decompiler understandability study. And let me just quickly go into this background again. I've seen you, I've shown you guys this before, but just a quick reminder. Um, reverse engineering is taking a program that you find in the wild, that you don't have the source code for, and understanding how it works. Uh, this can be done with malware. This can be done with uh, updating old software uh, from, say, COBOL to a language that exists. Um, and it, it's done a lot by reverse engineers. And one of the primary tools that they use is called a decompiler. This is a screenshot of IDA, which is a disassembler, which takes uh, binary code and spits out the sequence of instructions that are executed. And uh, it has a decompiler plugin on the right here. And what this does is it takes that sequence of instructions and it converts them into a high level representation that looks like C, for example. This is the core problem with decompilation uh, as far as I've been approaching it um, for my research. Decompilers are really good at rebuilding structure, such as loops, and they're really bad at rebuilding things once they can't compute them anymore. And the reason why this happens is because compilation throws out this information. And this is all information that can't be recomputed. Uh, comments, uh, loop constructs, you can't tell which of several loop constructs someone has used. Uh, but the two that I focus on in my work are variable names and user defined type defs. Uh, these are not computable. You can largely pick whatever variable name you want. Uh, you could define whatever type you want. The names do not matter that much. So this is just impossible to Here's an example of two functions. On the left is a typical implementation of uh, a function that takes two points. Uh, points are defined with this point struct at the top, and it just computes the distance uh, between the Euclidean distance. And on the right, you can see the problem with decompiled code. This is an actual example that I decompiled, and this was the output. Um, variables don't have names. Arguments don't have names. And uh, even the types are a little weird here. Uh, it look, the decompiler thinks these take uh, int pointers. And a little lower, it actually treats them like int arrays. You can't tell the difference between arrays and uh, structs here. So uh, this is the problem that I've been working to solve. And uh, I have created two techniques that solve each of these with machine learning. 
to make them better. So the whole theory behind what I've been doing and uh, why I think it's a good thing to do is that it is known that variable names and types provide useful information about the purpose of those variables and make code easier to understand. Uh, this is well known about source code, about, uh, and there are many, many studies over many years uh, that have established that this is the case with source code. My hypothesis, however, is slightly different than existing theory. My hypothesis is that this information is also, use, uh, is also useful when it comes to decompiled code. Now, this is subtly because when looking at decompiled code, uh, everything is foreign, right? So it could be that uh, the task is already so foreign that the amount that is gained by, learn by having these types and, uh, and names is minimal compared to everything else. Um, we, we have been working with this hypothesis that this isn't the case, but uh, there are some arguments that can be made that like we really don't know. Um, so far, most work that actually recovers types or recovers names has only uh, measured how close the recovered types and names get to whatever the developer originally wrote rather than uh, rather than seeing if it actually improves the code. So here are the gaps. Here are the three questions that I want to answer with this work. The first one is, do these variable types and names make decompiled code easier to understand and work with? And there's another subdivision. Uh, we want to know if decompile, if these variables and uh, these variable names and types make professionals jobs easier that is reverse engineers that do this every day and another thing that came up while uh, in in chats that i've had with professional uh, reverse engineers is does this information actually help novice reverse engineers uh, use decompilers more readily because one big problem that uh, reverse engineers have is there's very few of them and there's a lot of work to be done so they would like to lower the bar of entry. So from this, uh, I propose to put together two study groups. Um, the first one is a group of professional reverse engineers at the Software Engineering Institute. Um, I've been working closely with people over at the Software Engineering Institute, and uh, they have volunteered their time. Uh, but Part of the problem with this is you basically get one chance to study them and uh, you're done. There just aren't many uh, professionals. But another thing that we, I would like to study is actually graduate and undergraduate students, that is novices with decompilers. And this will help us help me answer both of these questions that I asked. So, this motivates two different study designs, actually, and I propose to do both of these. The first study will study professionals. Um, one of the two of the advantages to studying professionals is that uh, because they use decompilers daily, they understand their uh, they they, they understand how to work with a decompiler. They understand what features are useful, and they can intuitively uh, understand. Yes, this feature adds information and lowers uh, the cognitive load that I have to do day in and day out. And another um, interesting thing that, uh, that I thought of is that reverse engineers have access to real world tasks, which isn't really something that uh, I, as a, as a graduate student, do. Uh, so they will be able to use tools that I provide them to study actual malware in the wild. So because of this, the, uh, the study design that I propose here is uh, giving, them the, giving them a tool and after they work with it for some amount of time, conducting semi-structured interviews to understand their experiences, understand what they found useful and uh, understand what they might not have found uh, as useful. And also 
this information will inform the task selection for uh, the study of novices. And this is the second part of my study. For novices, this study is, is different. This semi-structured interview thing doesn't work too well uh, because decompilers are already rarely used and novices are really unlikely to have experience using it. Um, this is bad in one way in that um, they don't know how to use decompilers, but it's also good because uh, there's fewer variables when con conducting a controlled experiment. Everybody starts with probably about the same level of knowledge and the same level of expertise with, uh, with these tools. And uh, the, the plan is to conduct an experiment in a controlled environment. That is with, a, with an experimenter at a specific machine on a specific setup. Um, because of the unfamiliarity uh, that novices have, this means that participants will need uh, some sort of training. So uh, I'm envisioning a single session to start with training uh, with a sit down tutorial with an experimenter. Another uh, nice side effect of this is uh, decompiler licensing is very expensive with the decompilers that we've been using. I only have one license. So uh, just set up at one machine makes this a lot easier to run. Um, what, during this training, uh, we'll record uh, training and participants will be instructed to talk aloud while learning and while solving these tutorial problems. This is a, a known technique to uh, understand what people's confusions are and, uh, and where they're having trouble. And then after this training, uh, there will be a short problem set to be solved uh, with a, a sequence of, of questions uh, related to decompilation. And then there will be a post-study interview uh, collecting some additional information. So the data, this is the list of data that will be collected for this study. Uh, one is notes and recordings of, during training. Um, all of the notes and the uh, recorded actions will be coded uh, to understand what the actual difficulties are and, uh, and what the difference is between the two treatment groups. Um, I will also do a screen recording. This is really easy if I control the computer that is being used. Um, there will also be timing and correctness information collected for the uh, post-training test. And then uh, for the experience and uh, for the uh, post-study interview, I'll collect uh, experience information, demographic information, and things like that so that we can control for that. Um, an additional stretch goal that I, uh, that I would like to do is eye tracking to see um, if participants are actually focusing on things like variable names while trying to do this reverse engineering. Uh, so this is my proposed work. Uh, and, and this is the study that I plan to do. This actually fits in nicely with my proposed work for my uh, thesis too. Cool, is this the end? This is the end, yes. Great, thanks. Any thoughts from the room? Thank you for being on time. Oh, you're welcome. Nice change. One, one thing um, that I didn't get a chance to type in, in chat yet, uh, they're thinking, it seems, so I like the novice study, but it seems that you're maybe testing lots of things all at once. Um, it seems like you're testing people's ability to learn um, decompilation, to learn the specifics of the decompiler, to kind of you know learn reverse engineering, all at the same time as testing the value of providing this additional information about names and types. So like if your goal is to evaluate the usefulness of names and types, for code understandability, it seems you could completely separate the two parts of this kind of yeah. you know, to remove the um, 
uh, I don't know, intricacies of dealing with reverse engineering and decompilation from that and to test that more cleanly, uh, if, if that's what you're trying to do. But just a just thought to you know, keep in mind for your final report. Sort of how, yeah, how I, get together. I was thinking about this and I thought since the goal is say lowering the barrier to entry, I sort of want to test if the barrier to entry is actually lowered. Mm -hmm. um, and it would be interesting to know if this is actually the case, if this actually does help. Mm -hmm. All right, well, thank you. Good luck. Who is next? I think I'd go next. Oh, okay. <laughs> Dang it. <laughs> okay, I would go next. Um, let me share my slides. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Hongbo. Today, I'm going to present our research proposal together with Sam, my teammate, um, in innovation in open source software. First of all, there has been a lot of study, uh, studying uh, innovation in a lot of contexts. I mean, there has been a lot of theories stating uh, how the innovation works, what's the process of innovation, and what factors motivate innovation, or how we can make a group of people more innovative, things like that. So uh, you might wonder why we want to look at innovation in open source software, or is there anything specific about open source software that uh, we think innovation here might be different from innovation other, uh, in other places. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, we do believe there is a difference. So first of all, let's look at the traditional view of uh, innovation process. Uh, one of the very popular and famous uh, theories states that uh, there are three major steps uh, in innovation. You must first uh, produce some novel knowledges. And then you transform this knowledge into some products. And lastly, you need to continuously match the products to the market needs or user demands. Those are the three major steps. So taking this view, we believe there are at least two major differences between innovation in OSS uh, and innovation in other fields. Firstly, in step one and step two, which is the production and implementation of new knowledges. In traditional innovation theory or uh, study that they look at what we call closed innovation today. So here the innovative ideas come from, uh, so you, they usually study innovation in a major company or organization. And the innovation ideas come from inside of this company. You probably talk with your colleagues about inventing something new. And the most of the benefit of this innovation will have, is harvested by the company. So there was a clear boundary restricting who can contribute to the innovation and who will harvest the benefit of, uh, of the innovation. But what we see today in OSS are more similar to so-called open innovation, uh, which is basically that the idea of innovation may come outside of the, the team or uh, the innovative team and the benefit of the innovation may not only uh, help or benefit the innovation, uh, the team who did this innovation. So if you want to produce a software in uh, open source, uh, contact, open source uh, way that uh, a lot of people can contribute new ideas and they can also benefit from the product uh, that you produce. So this is the difference between closed innovation and open innovation. And you might ask the question why, so in an open source way, uh, in open innovation, why people want to share innovative ideas or how do you collaborate with someone you may not know very well to innovate something new. So I'm glad you asked this question because that's the exact difference uh, between closed innovation and uh, open innovation. And that's why we want to study uh, open innovation. So secondly, that most of the innovation we look at in the past was so-called innovation by professionalist. If you're a company, you look at uh, paid a, a, a group of researchers hired by the company. Or if you are in a university, you have faculties, you have students, they are professionals of uh, an innovation team. And across time that the, the team member 
are more stable comparing with the situation in OSS, where most of the developers are volunteers, uh, which means that even core members can leave the project. And uh, so uh, in the third step of the innovation, that how uh, innovative team can continuously update or upgrade the project to meet the user demand if uh, the team's members, the team members are not stable enough. So that's the difference between uh, innovation in OSS and innovation in other fields. So based on all this, that we do believe there was a major difference between the innovation we might be able to see in OSS and other fields. And this is a question that was studied. And you might still remember that in my research proposal a couple of months ago, that we mentioned we are the first to conduct uh, similar research. We are the first to look at innovation specifically in open source field. So we need to do a lot of fundamental things to set up the research stage. So uh, our, uh, our goal in this task is threefold. We want to have a good measurement of uh, open source projects, uh, good measurement of innovation level of open source projects. And we want to provide a preliminary description of how innovative uh, overall is the OSS community today and how does the innovative level of OS community evolve over time. And lastly, we want to provide some understanding about what factors motivate innovation in open source context. So that's the three major goal of the study. And I will talk about the first goal, uh, the measurement, and Sam will talk about the second and last. So uh, for the innovation measurement, there actually has been a lot of um, the proposed metrics uh, in other innovation study. Um, so the simplest one and the early one was a straightforward way to measure the use quality of study. They just ask uh, people who uh, how innovative do you think something is. Of course, it's, a, it's probably very accurate, but it's definitely not suitable if we want to measure the innovative level of let's say 1 million open source projects. So the second uh, class of measurement they look at the citation of a patent or analogy of it would be the number of citation of a scientific paper. But uh, as we have discussed a lot in our class, uh, the citation is not a good matrix of innovation. Um, and the highly cited research doesn't mean this research is very innovative. So today, we believe that citation or citation-based metrics is not a good enough metrics. So what we want to use uh, in our study is these two new metrics. It's called a typical combination and disruption of citation. Both of these two concepts are proposed in the field of science of science, where they look at the uh, public, uh, the scientific publication. Uh, and I will briefly introduce the high-level idea of these metrics in the context of science of science and talk about how we want to adopt them in OSS. So first of all, a typical combination is basically whether the paper uh, combines two novel concepts together. Let's say we have uh, uh, two concepts uh, like COVID or vaccine. And if you publish a paper uh, talking about these two things, it's the convention thing, it's nothing novel because COVID and vaccine are uh, usually or frequently talked together. But if you want to publish a paper uh, talking about COVID, uh, probably with Robin Hood, and you definitely, is a, it may be a novel or innovative project because you combine two novel things, you combine two things in a novel way and no one has ever done it before. So in the field of OSS, uh, we talk about the combination of new libraries. So if one project uh, import two libraries and most of the other projects doesn't import these two together. And we think this project is innovative because it's uh, a typically combined two libraries together. So the second definition is called a disruption. It's actually a quite complicated process. So I will try to explain. So uh, in the field of science of science, if I publish a paper and all the, uh, uh, there are a lot of people that cite my paper and uh, when I publish this paper, I will definitely cite a lot of the other papers. If all the paper that cites me doesn't cite the paper that I cited, then my paper will be innovative because 
if my paper was only a development on the previous work, that all those papers cite me might also cite the paper that I cited. So that's basically the high level idea of how this matrix works. So in our case, in the field of open source software, that we look at the dependency of projects instead of the citation uh, networking, uh, the science of science and use disruption to measure the innovation of a project. And we actually want to use both of these metrics in our study and we want to compare uh, whether the results are, uh, from both two metrics are different in any way. And here I just uh, listed the reason why I think uh, using this metrics is better than all the metrics we described before, why survey is not good, why citation is not good. Um, and also we want to vet, because we are the first one to adopt these two metrics in open source, we want to make a validation of it. So what we plan to do is we send out surveys to other open source developers and ask them to propose some innovative project. And we test their proposed project against our metrics to see if our metrics is a good reflection of the innovation perceived by the uh, OSS developers. So all those are just some high level ideas uh, about why we want to study this question or why we choose some metrics over others. And Sam will talk more about the uh, details of how what we can do after we get this matrix uh, and some details in terms of uh, implementation and I will uh, switch to Sam. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so yeah, so um, before we go into um, how we might use the innovation measurements we get, uh, I just want to briefly talk about the data set we're going to use. We are going to use the, a data set called the word of code. Uh, which is uh, known to be uh, the most comprehensive, the most complete record of, of all of the open source software projects out there in the world. Uh, so to just give you a sense of the scope of it, it has uh, over 70 million uh, non-forked projects, uh, public projects, um, and with uh, over a billion commits in those projects. So it's a pretty, um, it's pretty comprehensive database of the open, of open source software. It also contains some information uh, like timestamp project dependencies um, that might be useful in our calculation of the innovation metrics uh, that are not necessarily readily available in other data sets. Uh, so as you, um, as, you, uh, as you can see from previous, uh, from Bobo's uh, description of our metrics, um, we are looking at, for example, dependency network or the information or the content network uh, of the, of the packages or the libraries projects use. So we do want to use a, um, a data set that is as complete as possible so that we can look at the entire landscape, landscape of uh, open source software. Uh, next slide, please. So um, yeah, so once we, once we have the metrics of the measurements of the innovativeness of different projects in the open source um, community, what we want to first look at is how, uh, how they look like. Because um, as Bobo mentioned, we are among the first to study innovativeness in open source. So we want to look at what innovation uh, looks like in the open source community, what projects are innovative, and uh, also what's the dynamic change. So uh, how do projects change in terms of their innovativeness over time? Uh, next slide, please. Yeah. Uh, so another thing that we want to do uh, after we have the innovativeness of different projects over time is that we want to study what characteristics of the teams or the developers or the projects contribute to the project's innovativeness or in, uh, the project's innovation levels. Uh, and to do that, we want to use a mixed method, a, a sort of a sequential exploratory strategy. Uh, first, we want to do a semi-structured interview uh, to understand how to understand what characteristics are important for, um, for contributors to produce innovation in the open source context. So we want to, uh, we want to interview uh, the uh, contributors or core contributors of some of the innovative projects that we identified by our metrics. And some of the questions we might want to ask them is for example, uh, how important is the team dynamics in the, um, in to the open source uh, innovation and creativity? And what are some of the uh, critical things that stimulate innovative thinking in the open source context, and also what um, might undermine innovation. Next slide, please. 
And then uh, the next step is then we want to use a more quantitative approach. We want to, um, from, from the interviews, we might find out some influential factors uh, that people identify that might, uh, that might affect uh, or contribute to different innovative levels of different pro projects. Uh, and so here are some of the, so of course we haven't done the interviews yet, so we don't uh, exactly know what factors there might be. But these are some of the things that we hypothesize. Uh, for example, the size of the contributor team or the team's diversity in terms of their knowledge background or gender diversity or how long they've been in the community. And then um, we, we might also want to look at some of the coordination mechanisms. So how do people coordinate? How do contributors coordinate on the open source projects? How, what platforms they use or what technologies they use? And um, once we, uh, so, so the plan is we want to then calculate some of these metrics for the projects that we identify as either innovative or less innovative. And then we want to perform some kind of regression model on all of these character characteristics to see what characteristics are um, important or um, are associated with innovation in, in open source software. And I believe that is our project, yeah. That is the, our presentation. Thank you. So it took me a moment to unmute. Thanks a lot, this was great. What do people think? Uh, so suggestions or questions? I can start with one. There's one big thing I'm missing from this, and that's the, the so what question. Like, why are you doing this? I can see how it's so just so intrinsically interesting to study this, but what are, what's the uh, problem gap hook? What's the hook? Who's going to benefit from this and how and why? What's the hook? What are the implications of uh, this? study and uh, these models and so on. Are you saying we should encourage more innovation? So we should, you know, find some knobs to turn to produce more innovation? Or we can't really control that anyway, right? This is sort of very decentralized, bottom up. People do whatever they want. So how, I, I guess that's the question. Like, What are the implications? Um, so I, I can start with, uh, I can start. So I guess the, the idea is that uh, innovative has been considered a very uh, a, a important booster of, um, uh, of the, the progress in a lot of fields, uh, including the OSS communities. For example, Linux itself is a very innovative project and it's very different from uh, the traditional software uh, uh, building systems we use. So I think uh, generally that people welcome the um, innovative project and I think it can uh, have uh, may produce a lot of benefits to the to the users. So that's, that's I guess, um, so we assume that innovation is a good thing and there's a thing that welcome the by the software developers. And that's why we wanted to see what factors we are motivating innovation. I mean, what are the implications for practice? What, what should we do differently? Uh, how should we redesign open source communities, uh, platforms that host open source projects, practices in these communities, uh, things like that? What should we do differently after your study? Yes, I guess the question can be answered uh, with better with the third question, what are the factors contribute to the innovation? So just uh, use some examples listed here. For example, we study whether the diversity of the teams helps the innovation. Uh, so if so, we can try to form a more uh, form a team with more diverse background. Uh, and all that we study, what kind of coordination mechanisms boost innovation so that we can try to adopt those mechanisms more so that we can generate more innovative product. Yeah, I agree. I just want to add on to that. Yeah, um, I think there are 
like uh, Bogdan, like you said, I think there uh, we from from this study uh, we could find uh, that maybe there are some interventions that we can do on the open source platforms, for example, on GitHub. Uh, and and if we suppose we find that um, that diver team diversity is an important contributor to um, to innovation, then the next step would be what kind of intervention that we might want to do to encourage uh, more diverse teams, for example, to encourage um, minority groups to stay in the in their teams that longer to stay on the open source community longer. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, who's next? Can I go next? Nice. Uh, that didn't work. <laughs> Slash, uh, wait. Yes, there you go. All right. Um, okay, cool. Hello, everyone. Um, today I'll be talking about language design for large scale IoT applications. So imagine a future where self driving cars are the norm. These cars would be connected to a grid of other cars and infrastructure to expertly maneuver without the need of traffic lights, as you can see. IoT would make this possible with sensors streaming information and actuators reacting to it, and all of them connected to the internet. However, this application hangs in a very delicate balance with respect to time. If a car fails to respond in time to change in its pathing, like for example, in the braking, um, a car could very well crash. So our application here is very time sensitive and operates over multiple devices to work. So designing and creating these applications are very challenging. Uh, creating distributed systems is already a very difficult task. IoT devices, they vary widely regarding in their hardware capabilities and software platforms. So a programmer would need to interface with each separate device and create a standard between them. So you already have a separation of different programs that could potentially be written by different, um, by different programmers and all of these programs are split. Furthermore, time is difficult to maintain in distributed notion, let alone in a power constrained domain. Each device has its own notion of time and it's expensive to keep them synchronized. Furthermore, um, I guess current tools, it's also very difficult to specify time if the language itself isn't very well geared towards time. So for current IoT frameworks, there's been a lot of good work in developing these um, issues that we've discussed. Um, for example, real-time operating systems, it's a very old field in which um, these frameworks are helped to achieve timing deadlines. And they're used in very time critical situations such as like um, NASA's um, uh, launch uh, for satellites and um, robots. Um, we also have synchronous languages. Um, they create predictable models of execution of code and um, they provide a nice model for programmers to um, understand how to put code together and make sure that uh, things run um, together. Uh, finally, we also have macro programming languages, which uh, they also tackle the issue of homogenizing hardware in the network. Um, IoT, the, this, the strength in IoT is the fact that because it is so cheap, you can use so many sensors in the network. Um, however, um, that means you also have a lot of companies that were working in the field. Therefore, we need a way to somehow homogenize like all, all these different um, platforms. So macro programming takes that approach and you start writing these applications in a very large scope so you can work across multiple devices at once. Now, unfortunately, um, none of these frameworks have become a mainstream component yet in IoT application development. And uh, let's look at why. So real-time operating systems, um, they often lack distribution um, support across multiple devices. They also provide a framework to um, write time-aware code, but they put the onus on the developer to ensure that you have time safety of the program. They don't do the actual checking of the program. So um, more often than not, um, the programmer has to cut corners and uh, make sure that whatever they write is actually 
compliant to the actual time requirements of their program. Synchronous languages um, provide great abstractions in achieving predictable time sensitive actions, but they require a lot of uh, the techniques to make sure that they have these predictable time sensitive actions um, consume a lot of energy. Um, so in IoT, um, because our devices are naturally, um, they don't often have a natural uh, power source. Um, lots of uh, techniques that consume lots of energy are, um, well, bad. So we need a way to essentially tune like uh, the way that we, um, that we can do our time synchrony. And then in macro programming languages, uh, it follows a distributed, distributed system notion of, of consistency and ordering. It's simply not compatible with the time sensitive nature in IoT. Um, so they, they do this approach in a very distributed systems manner um, in which you aren't worried about the domains, uh, domain specific issues in IoT. And um, therefore, uh, it, all of these, all of these um, approaches they have really great aspects to them, but they all kind of miss a little one thing that uh, makes it fall short in terms of having a complete solution to these IoT applications. So yeah, IoT applications are hard to design um, because we have so many um, specific IoT, um, no, uh, IoT effects such as like the distribution of code, where code goes, um, the power, um, how much power this piece of code um, requires and also the timing requirements for your application. So what if we could write a single program to um, rule the intersection? Essentially the programmer, um, they would, uh, we would have a platform that would incorporate these distribution techniques and time requirements and developers would only need to write a single program and we could separate the correctness and the intent of the program with the division of the program across devices. So instead of developers working on separate um, programs for each device, they can simply collaborate on a single um, uh, on a single program, and this program would be split across different devices in your network, and um, therefore you don't have to worry about the intricacies of where things need to go, and you can only you only need to focus on the importance of the important parts of the program. So that's what TikTok is that we're planning to do. Um, it's an API and infrastructure to interface with distributed low power IoT devices and cloud computing. So we're trying to simplify programming in IoT while still exposing the necessary trade-offs for users to design the programs because IoT generally is a domain full of trade-offs. Um, and we want to encapsulate this system interface through a language, which is what I'm primarily interested in. So the research questions that I'd like to answer are um, what kind of abstractions are helpful to the programmer in developing large IoT applications? And um, also um, knowing these and incorporating them in TikTok, um, can people effectively use and understand these trade-offs um, between abstractions in TikTok that are necessary to develop large scale applications? So I'd like to go into detail um, why um, why we would want to do um, look at these research questions. Um, firstly, uh, I myself, although I've had some experience in embedded uh, development, I wouldn't say that I'm an expert in terms of um, developing large scale IoT applications. So um, yeah, so like the, um, that's why I would like to um, reach out to others to understand more on uh, their expertise in terms of uh, these applications. So um, yes, so methodology, yeah, let me first jump into the methodology. So to, to better understand kind of the IoT domain, um, we'd like, I'd like to do semi-structured interviews to develop case studies for these IoT applications or these exercises. So we've had, we have many collaborators. Um, we have some collaborators on the project itself contributing to TikTok and they themselves would be interested in using TikTok for um, the lightless um, traffic application. So um, that's uh, that was one example that we generated in terms of um, what are important things that the programmer needs to design these applications. Another is the USGS, the US Geological Survey. They're interested in looking at meteorological um, 
uh, phenomena, and uh, they want to use IoT sensors to um, do passive long-term sensing to understand these phenomena. So they, these are also another potential group in which we can interview and talk to them into learning more about how to understand these IoT applications. Um, yeah, so after that, we'd like to design a tutorial um, understanding these um, what's necessary to create an IoT application. Um, we'd like to design a tutorial uh, on as a usability study, introducing the TikTok language um, and using uh, applications to test their knowledge of the TikTok language. Oh, so yeah. So um, I guess I kind of went over it already in this slide, but um, some of the questions that we'd like to answer um, through this research question are kind of like the, what kind of applications are you making for your IoT devices and what requirements are necessary in your application? So we already have a notion of what kind of abstractions would be helpful in TikTok, um, mainly uh, the three that I've been discussing, power, time, and uh, distribution. But um, this would give us a uh, groundwork in terms of um, ensuring that these make sense in terms of constructs and language. And furthermore, these would be uh, these exercises that we find through the interviews. Um, they would be helpful in terms of creating the tutorial as they would be valid um, exercises to use. Um, so why, yeah, so for our next research question, um, IoT is a domain usually full of design decisions um, because um, power and hardware capabilities are limited, timing and distribution of code can be dependent on the requirements. So um, because oftentimes uh, your this, the battery source for your devices are limited, um, you may not be able to achieve synchrony at a, a higher synchrony between a time synchrony between your devices because it will cost more energy. Um, and if you were to do that, then your devices may run out of battery um, very quickly, like within a month. And maybe if instead you um, decreased the amount of synchrony between your devices to maybe seconds, then you would be able to extend the lifetime to too many years, essentially. So um, ideally our compiler would have this ability um, once you create the code on the left, once you write your application um, and then push it out to um, a test bed, it would be able to tell you how, um, what would be the expected lifetime of the devices that you push your code out to. Um, because of this application, and also whether um, the time requirements could actually be satisfied um, with the configuration that you have in the network. So then um, we want to see in like this design um, for the programmer to kind of um, given like maybe a lightless uh, traffic application with saying like, oh, we want to make sure that cars uh, don't crash within uh, this application, but not giving like, um, I guess exact numbers such as we want a time synchrony between these devices and giving these de design decisions in this exercise, we could then see uh, whether the programmer could then do this kind of continual um, cycle of testing the program with these set of parameters and seeing how they react on the field and changing the parameters of time and um, distribution uh, based on that. So after they can, after they do this design decision, they would um, uh, defend their uh, design between uh, why they chose these certain parameters. So yeah, we we hope to see that like this design uh, this this design exercise would kind of um, show their it would show both their understanding of how to develop IoT applications as well as like um, uh, the difficulties um, or and whether our abstractions of TikTok are helpful in terms of. Uh, balancing these uh, abstractions. So future goals um, after potentially all of this uh, research has been done, um, we'd like to compare whether TikTok um, to other current um, common embedded development tools for IoT applications, how, do, how does TikTok stand? So of course, another, another tool could be something like RTOS, NSC, Pretzi, um, kind of one of the um, it would be like an older model of uh, IoT applications. And we would do a random assignment to either TikTok or the other tool. 
and then we would do um, we would kind of have a similar uh, tutorial for each each of them and also run through a usability study on both of these uh, uh, both of these tools or languages and some measured variables um, this is just a few um, there could be more but um, I'm imagining that we could uh, measure like the time taken for each exercise and also the number of bugs <clears throat> uh, that you generate um, for uh, for each participant on a sp specific uh, exercise so yeah um, just want to give a quick research progress because of course it is ongoing and um, uh, haven't really finished uh, either like the interviews or um, the usability study. Um, so yeah, the, currently we have like the language specified, but um, with the compiler is still underway, um, the intermediate representation that runs on top <clears throat> of these devices, um, it's uh, being iterated on right now. It's There's still some issues in terms of this distributed notion of time, but um, that's a uh, open research question we're working on. And I guess the exciting part is the testing and validation part in, in which um, we actually have a subset of the language working on the, um, the lightless traffic application and where we can, where, um, yeah, it's working with like two cars. So that's exciting news. So yeah, at this point, I'd like to uh, thank the TikTok team, which is a bunch of people at CMU and also ASU and yeah, um, at this point, um, I can take questions. Awesome, thanks. Anything from the room? Sure. From my side, the big thing was, um, you could have said a little bit more about how you're going to do the usability study, or the user study, uh, meaning is, is that an actual experiment? Do you sort of assign people to different conditions? Uh, and if so, what are you measuring exactly? So this notion of usefulness or helpfulness, so how do you actually measure that? Um, there's something to think about for the report. I left comments in chat, so feel free to, to save those. Are these uh, model cars somewhere we could play with? They look very fun. Yeah, um, I think the collaborators at ASU, um, they own like, uh, they have a few of these cars, so um, I think that's where they're doing the testing right now. Um, I think some people on the team here at CMU have a few of the GPUs that run on the cars, but I don't think they have the cars themselves. All right, thanks. Thanks, Kyle. Good job. Who's next? I think that I am. And I'm happy to go next anyway. Uh, okay, let me share my screen. Okay, everyone can see it okay? All right, good. Then I'm, can I go ahead and start? Okay, hold on, let me move your faces out of the way. Uh, Okay, so hi everyone. Today I'll be talking to you about the design of a novel study that evaluates gradual, gradual verification's applicability to practice. Um, but first I'll explain what gradual verification is and why it's important. Um, so consider that Jenny wants to ensure that her find max function returns the maximal element of a list. Therefore, she specifies the post condition in red and applies a static verifier to the code. Unfortunately, the tool fails because it requires many more specifications. In Jenny's case, she will need to specify a precondition, loop invariance, folds and unfolds, and, a, and lemmas as highlighted here in orange. Worse even is that she can't check a single specification for correctness without providing all the required specifications here. Instead, gradual verification is an approach that allows developers to incrementally build up correctness specifications and proofs without additional effort 
Therefore, developers can focus on specifying and verifying the most important properties and components of their system and receive immediate verification feedback, statically where possible and dynamically where necessary. The framework to build a gradual verifier was first introduced by Beta et al. in 2018. While this work was promising, it was only applicable to very simple programs with very simple specifications. So in 2020, Wise et al., aka our group, um, extended Beta et al.'s work to support more realistic programs containing recursive heap data structures like lists, trees, and graphs. Further, they're designing and implementing a prototype based on this work called Gradual Viper. Um, Gradual Viper is simply being implemented on top of Viper's symbolic execution-based static verifier. And after its completion, um, a, tremendous, a tremendous amount of important exciting research can be performed. So um, one such study is the one that I have designed and will be introducing in this talk. But first, let's talk about um, empirical studies that uh, of related verification talk technology that have influenced this work. Um, so I explored some related studies of static, dynamic, and hybrid verification tools. Um, they were often considered simulations, which applied the tool to a number of selected examples that modeled the real world or real world code. Um, and then sometimes static verification tools in particular were also evaluated with case studies. Further, uh, the studies would compare the tool to either state-of-the-art alternative tools or benchmarks. However, not all hybrid verification tools were evaluated comparatively. And that's because it was um, some new technology then. And then finally, uh, static verification tools were evaluated in terms of annotation burden, completeness, and runtime performance. Dynamic tools were also evaluated in terms of runtime performance. And hybrid tools were evaluated in terms of the trade-offs it could support between static assurances and runtime performances. Uh, so, oh, okay. Well, basically, so, hold on, I missed like a point that is really important. Um, so I draw on this prior work <laughs> for the design of my study, as you will see in following slides. Um, but Gradual Viper's technical advances over prior work leads to a novel empirical study for this new domain. Um, so I propose a summative study of Gradual Viper, which quantitatively investigates its applicability to practice. Um, and that's, there's two facets to this. The first one explores how changes in partial specifications affect the number of static assurances we can make and the resulting dynamic verification overhead. And the second um, facet of the exploration explores if and how gradual Viper's support of partial specifications with both static and dynamic techniques allows it to verify more programs than Viper, its underlying static system. So in other words, we're really interested in seeing how if gradual Viper's new technology can help us overcome um, incompleteness in static systems. And the tree is, uh, and this is kind of has two different designs for each of these kind of sub-studies. And so um, we'll talk about the first study, the first sub-study first. Um, and to reiterate, uh, we're investigating the impact of different partial specifications on what can be then statically versus dynamically verified and resulting uh, verification runtime overhead. I I'm attempting to answer the following research questions. And so uh, one goal of this exploration is to then provide recommendations for users of what specifications to write to get certain trade-offs. And so that's kind of like the motivation behind these research questions. Um, and so the first one, um, as, we as we vary lines of specification code, research question one asks what trends emerge in the resulting percentage of verification conditions checked statically versus dynamically. And then similarly, as we as lines of specification code are varied, research question two asks what trends emerge in the resulting dynamic verification overhead. And then to answer these questions, I first plan to generate an example set for analysis, where each example adheres to the following criteria. Um, it'll be an implementation of a method, such as insertion, lookup, or removal of a list, tree, and or graph data structure. It'll be bug free. It'll be expressible and statically specifiable in gradual Viper's supported front end language and specification language. 
and it might possibly come from Viper and Verifast documentation to increase the likelihood there's a full static specification available and um, increase the likelihood that gradual Viper can actually support it. So after selecting an example set, the next step is to, for each increment, choose a functional property. That's like uh, uh, your return, like we're trying to prove that a list is sorted after returning the list um, to verify the example against. In general, upwards of three different properties may be chosen per example. And then for each example, property pair specification increments are generated from complete dynamic verification to complete static verification for the property. The first increment is the completely dynamic solution, which contains only the property specified and uh, imprecision otherwise. Then the following increments each contain additional single specification constructs compared to its predecessor, increasing precision along the way until it's completely statically verified. Note, multiple specification constructs could be contenders for addition um, from one increment to the other. So multiple increment paths exist for, the property, for a property. I illustrate a single path here, but we generate all paths for analysis. Then each specification increment for each example and property is verified individually by Gradual Viper. And during this process, data is collected for the increment. Gradual Viper will report the number of verification conditions, or in other words, intermediate proof goals, checked statically, dynamically, and in total. And it also reports the time it takes to both execute the program and execute injected runtime checks for verification or in other words, the time to complete dynamic verification. Next, the data is aggregated into measures and recorded for each example and property increment. So these are our measures. Um, the first one is the percentage of verification conditions statically verified, and it's simply calculated by dividing the number of verification conditions statically verified by the number verified in total and multiplying by 100. Um, the percentage of verification conditions dynamically verified is calculated similarly, um, just using the number of verification conditions dynamically verified. And then more interestingly is the factor speed up or slowdown of runtime checks um, compared to the fully dynamic solution. And that's calculated in a few steps. First, we just run each example and increment 10 times and average the dynamic verification times across those runs. Um, we call that T sub PI. Um, the second is to run each example program 10 times without specifications and then average the program execution time across those runs. We call that T sub P. And then, then we can compute the average time spent executing the injected runtime checks um, on its own by just subtracting T sub P from T sub PI. And so we'll have this number for each increment, um, specification increment and example. So we can, can then compute the factor speed up or slow down um, by dividing that increment's runtime against the fully dynamic solutions runtime to create our factor. And then you'll note if it's less than one, it's a speed up. If it's greater than one, it's a slow down. Now that we aggregated the data, we can visualize it in different ways to, uh, to explore different trends. First, we'll create lattices like the one here for each example and property. A lattice node is highlighted in orange, and it contains a specification increment defined by a sequence of ovals. Each oval represents a specification construct, and a filled-in oval indicates that the construct is specified, while an empty oval indicates that it's not specified. So then we can simply create all the possible specification increments for an example and property, by toggling the ovals on and off and creating our lattice. Now you'll notice that each increment node um, is labeled with corresponding data. Uh, and in this example, it's the factor speed up or slow down of runtime checks. Um, and I propose creating uh, a performance lattice like this one for each example property pair with the speed up and slow down factors. And I also suggest creating a static lattice with the percentage of verification conditions statically verified. And so then we can take those lattices and inspect them more closely. And in particular, I'd like to choose some paths for each example and property that are very fast or very slow to reach a high percentage of statically verified 
conditions or and that have high or low dynamic verification overhead to visualize further in these more um, increment path graphs. And one of the graphs I suggest creating is uh, one that has lines of specification code on the x-axis and percentage of verification conditions checked statically on the y-axis. I also suggest creating a second graph that's similar, except with the y-axis now containing um, verification conditions checked dynamically. And, and then uh, for the third graph, I suggest uh, also then visualizing the factor speed up or slow down on the y-axis. And you can also add a red threshold line for a factor of one to better indicate speed ups and slowdowns. And then the last visualization I propose is a table which summarizes the average effect of each type of specification construct on each metric across all example properties and increment paths better, to better help uh, make, recommendation, make recommendations to users. And the table has uh, the following headers. Um, type of specification contract added in an increment, average increase and decrease in the percentage of statically checked verification conditions, average increase and decrease in the percentage of dynamically checked verification conditions, and the median increase and decrease in the factor speed up or slow down of dynamic verification overhead. Um, then we can just deeply inspect all of our visualizations to answer research question one and two, looking for trends in the static and dynamic data, um, particularly in relation to the types of constructs contained in the specification increments and their complexity, the kinds of properties being verified, the style of implementation of the example method, recur like recursion or iteration, the type of method, insertion, removal, and inspection, and the type of data structure. I hope to answer questions like, does adding a recursive predicate as a loop invariant result in certain slowdowns or speed ups in dynamic verification overhead? And what is the recursion over it? And how does that affect the results and trends? Now briefly for the second study, I explore whether the ability of gradual verifiers to support imprecise specifications with both static and dynamic techniques allows them to overcome incompleteness in their underlying static systems. So I pro propose an attempt to answer the following research question. Does the incompleteness of Viper result in the same incompleteness in Gradual Viper, which can further be explained by what examples can Gradual ver Viper verify, if any, that Viper cannot due to incompleteness? How does Gradual Viper overcome incompleteness for such examples? And what static and dynamic trends emerge in such examples? And the last question is really trying to get at how can we inform users, like what trade-offs do users have to make to get uh, to overcome incompleteness? Like what do they give up in terms of static and dynamic checking? So to the answer to these questions, I plan to generate a different example set from the first sub-study. Um, it will be a, an example corpus used in Viper's incompleteness study. Uh, it will be from there. Um, it'll contain different types of incompleteness experienced by Viper. It'll be bug free and then expressible in gradual Viper supported front end language. Then for each example, I will explore whether the incompleteness in Viper can be overcome with various specification increments supported by gradual Viper. Um, if this is possible, then I will attempt to generate three types of specification increments for each example that overcome the incompleteness, one that maximizes static assurances, another that maximizes dynamic checking, and a third that minimizes dynamic verification overhead. This min-maxing is all in terms of three metrics that are, very, that are pretty much the same as the ones that we saw before, um, except for instead of factors, instead of doing the division in factors, we're just uh, taking that average runtime check overhead and picking an appropriate level of granularity and recording it. Um, then also as before, we'll run each example and specification in Gradual Viper, collect and aggregate metrics and record them. I'm almost done. I know I'm a little over time. <laughs> so I'm just going to quickly finish up. Um, so then once we have that those data collected and aggregated, we go ahead and visualize them as before. And I suggest visualizing it by creating a table um, that contains the gradually verified example program name, the type of incompleteness it overcomes, specification increment type, which is 
such as maximizing static assurances, um, lines of specification code, and then the three metrics and so that we can then see how they, they're affected by overcoming incompleteness. Um, and then to answer the questions, I just uh, will discuss where partial specifications can be used to overcome incompleteness in Viper and how each specification does this. Um, and then to further contextualize this discussion and answer research question 3C, by discussing the previously introduced data table, which captures the trade-offs that can be made um, between static assurances and dynamic verification overhead and how that um, works with incompleteness. Um, and then last is my summary, but I will just skip that because it's basically a repeat of what I said before. Cool, thank you. Any any thoughts? Except for, of course, minus 100 points for being over time. <laughs> you can't win them all. So from my side, the one big thing, I think for this audience, I would have liked to see a little bit more discussion of the methods and sort of how they fit together. Um, and, uh, you know, we know you're an expert on all the technical details of, of your work that, that was never in, in question. We, uh, we want to see more sort of uh, discussion of the, maybe the evaluations and kind of how they fit together and less so of the technical details of the approach in this in this audience for this class i think you know depending on if, if this were sssg for example you probably want to do this differently but i think for this class the emphasis should have been more on methods and less on the um, so specifics of the approach okay that makes sense if that makes sense mm -hmm. kind of like i think i had this comment with austin on tuesday so sort of a comment on, on balance. All right. Well, then I think I think Ben, you have the honor of ending the semester for us. Yeah, out of pressure. Um, should I aim for closer to ten minutes, or to go for fifteen, or do whatever? Um, you know, I'm, I'm here. I'm happy to stay a few minutes over. I, I don't know if folks are. Okay. Um, so for my uh, research project, I was exploring the efficacy of scenario-based testing in autonomous vehicle systems. So as we can all probably agree, safety is important. Even more so, autonomous vehicle safety is very important when autonomous vehicles perform on safe actions. Um, you know, lives are at risk. Um, injuries can result. Um, and ultimately these are, you know, heavy machines that can go very fast. So ultimately, you know, before we have autonomous vehicles that we can trust with high levels of, of autonomy, uh, we want to be able to be confident in their safety. Unfortunately, it's quite hard to be confident in the safety of an autonomous vehicle. Um, this is for a number of reasons. Uh, they operate in complex unknown, unknown domains where, you know, any reasonable situation could happen and they have to be able to choose an appropriate action in any of these scenarios. Um, beyond that, they have hard to specify requirements, which often result in them using machine learning components. And since you have hard to specify requirements, uh, verification isn't really something that you can do very easily. Um, and ultimately you need to rely on some system level testing uh, to get the, the results that you're looking for. So this is a challenge. And well, how do we gain confidence in autonomous vehicle safety? We have some uh, confidence in them already. You know, they operate on real world roads uh, with some level of trust in there. Uh, and one of the, uh, I guess, more straightforward things you can do is to just drive it for a while. This can be in simulation or um, on real roads. This is from a Waymo safety report. Uh, of late last year, and they can, you know, they advertise that they have 20 plus million self-driven miles and 15 billion plus simulated miles. And with these amounts of miles that they've driven, then they can try to make, you know, statistical arguments about how their fault rate 
might be lower than the fault rate of uh, human drivers. And from that statistical argument, they can argue for their the safety of autonomous vehicles. Unfortunately, the, uh, the RAND Corporation did an investigation into uh, this approach. And, you know, unfortunately, a while is a very long time. So this plot is showing you that assuming that we have an autonomous vehicle that's 20% uh, better than uh, human drivers, we would need to drive for 5 billion miles in order to have a 95% confidence interval. And our fatality rate of the autonomous vehicle is actually lower than that of the human, human drivers. When you're considering that there are many contexts that you have to do this in, um, you start to realize that this is an infeasible approach. You need to do something else. So something else that's you know more in vogue recently is scenario-based testing. This is something you can do usually in simulation. Uh, basically, it's still this high-level system-level test of functionality, um, but you're cutting out all of the, I guess, uninteresting bits of the drives, and you're focusing on scenarios where you know maybe you have to overtake a vehicle in front of you, maybe you're trying to avoid a deer in the road, you might hydroplane for a second. Um, there are an infinite number of these scenarios and like it, pretty much an infinite number of these scenarios are also important. So this is a big problem for uh, testing and validating the safety of these vehicles. So since we have this infinite you know, sp scenario space, um, ultimately, scenario-based testing approaches rely on some scenario selection strategy and some set of test oracles. So scenario selection strategies uh, vary in what they're aiming to do. You know, some of them might just be a static set of, you know, pre-crash scenarios that are, you know, hard to complete. Uh, maybe the scenario selection strategies are trying to optimize to, you know, make scenarios more, more and more difficult until you observe some sort of safety violation. And along with the scenario selection strategy, you also have your set of test oracles. This is things like things that tell you if something went wrong. So if your car crashed into something, there's a traffic violation. Um, and there are some others that we'll talk about in a bit. But ultimately taking a step back, we might you know, wonder about why scenario-based testing gives us any confidence at all. Um, and it's appealing to this probabilistic argument that if something were wrong with the system, we would have seen it after, you know, running some large number of representative scenarios. And, you know, unfortunately, this leaves a lot of questions unanswered that have not really been explored by the community. Um, one of the first questions might be, you know, what is this large number? How, how long does it take to get to a place where we can trust our autonomous vehicles to uh, avoid unsafe behaviors? Other questions that, you know, we'll be looking to investigate are what kinds of bugs can we expect scenario-based testing to reveal? Um, so a traditional, uh, all of the you know, open source autonomous vehicle systems follow a similar uh, component architecture where you have some set of sensors that are you know, telling you what the world looks like. And this is perceived through your perception module, which tells you, you know, what the world looks like. Localization module will tell you where you are in that world. The prediction module will tell you how the world is expected to evolve. Um, and then that planning module is telling you, you know, what should my trajectory be given the, you know, world, world's evolution and my higher level goals. And then the control module is ultimately trying to turn your desired trajectories into actual uh, signals that you're sending to your actuators. Um, so what steering angle do we need? What, you know, brake amount? What, how, how hard do we want to press the gas? Um, and then that's ultimately just sent through the CAN bus, which is basically forwarding messages. And there are some other modules here, but um, we don't need to talk about those too much. You can see that, you know, there are different components, which you can imagine have different kinds of bugs. These bugs look different um, in practice. Um, and so a different kind of bug can be classified as a different affected component, uh, different causes of the bug. So what did the programmer do wrong that resulted in it? And what are the symptoms of the bug? So what do we actually observe in practice? And these uh, different you know, categories can be related to each other as well. And so now supposing we know a bug um, and we have 
you know, some scenario that we're testing against, we want to have some causal understanding of a bug corresponding to a specific crash or safety violation in our system. And to do this, we need to know that the bug was triggered by the scenario. We need to know that the observed safety violation happened after the bug was triggered. And we need to know that the safety violation could have otherwise been avoided. So you can imagine there are certain scenarios where you, know, you can't avoid a collision. You have to collide with something. Uh, there's just no other way. And so you have to know that you could have otherwise avoided it for it to be a meaningful signal to you. And as a small note, we're treating ML output as a black box. We don't really uh, worry about this in this, uh, in this study. We're more focused on traditional software bugs. So we might also wonder about which scenario selection strategies are superior for which kinds of bugs. We would expect some sort of interaction uh, between the scenario selection strategy and uh, the rate of you know, revealing certain types of bugs. There are a number of scenario selection strategies that have been proposed by researchers uh, with kind of evaluations that ha happen after the fact. Um, and so they don't really have a great way of doing comparative evaluations because a lot of these are on toy examples uh, with high internal validity, but questionable you know, external validity. And once you have complex software, things just change. Um, so these are a couple of the scenario selection strategies, the details of which are not super important. Um, and then we also have some set of test oracles. Uh, so we might also wonder similarly with test oracles, which ones are most effective at identifying bugs? There's crashes, traffic violations. Um, more interestingly, maybe there are also fine grain, like what I call quasi violations, where you didn't technically violate any you know, traffic laws, uh, but you certainly did do the wrong thing. So if you have somebody slam on their brakes in front of you and you do not react accordingly by trying to steer out of the way or hit your brakes, you can, even before you actually crash into them, you can know that you're doing something wrong. And you know, the, these are great questions to ask, but they are quite hard to answer in general. Um, and they haven't really been explored by the community, which kind of motivates the, the use of a case study to start to answer some of these questions in some way. And there are a number of open source, you know, autonomous vehicle software systems out there. We're focusing on Apollo just because it is a production quality software that's run on actual vehicles with high expectations for its performance. Um, and it, um, yeah, with high expectations for its performance, it's open source, it has a representative architecture. Um, and also somebody's already done a comprehensive study of the bugs in Apollo, which kind of gives us this set of known bugs to work from. Uh, ultimately, we found that the number of known bugs isn't quite enough to do the kind of study that we're looking for. Um, so we also are looking to kind of be informed by the kinds of bugs that occur in uh, different software components and use those to define mutation rules or how we can kind of inject faulty code um, into the system to define our own bugs to study. Um, yeah, all right. So now that we have all these pieces, we have our buggy versions of Apollo defined by our numerous bugs, artificial and historical. We have our number of scenario selection strategies. We have our test oracles. Um, and ultimately, we are looking to actually run um, these versions of buggy Apollo on a simulator. We're using the SVL simulator, uh, which is frankly the only one that can, can run um, Apollo. Uh, and so for each of our uh, basically data collection, we're using mutation analysis as our technique, um, where we, for each scenario selection strategy um, and each bug, we're gonna run a single scenario with the buggy version of Apollo, um, check for a runtime violation. If there's not one, go on to the next scenario. If there is one, uh, then we're going to want to rerun that scenario with the patched version and observe if that same traffic violation occurred. If the same traffic violation occurred, we can consider that bug revealed, the mutant killed, however you want to uh, call it. And if there is 
also a runtime violation with the uh, patched version, then we don't learn much from that individual case. So ultimately running these uh, experiments will give us some data, ignore the wasted ink in this table. Um, but so each row is just an observation. We would like to know whether the bug was revealed through the scenario selection strategy, uh, what type of bug it was. So this is a you know complex variable. I just didn't want to include all the different categories, but we're looking at the affected component, the cause, the symptoms, um, and then you know our scenario selection strategy, which one is that, and which test oracles were we using. And this will you know provide us with a number of observations. Um, which we can then you know, perform quantitative analysis on to answer um, some of the questions that we had before in the context of Apollo. So we might uh, be able to see what effect did the bug type have on whether a given bug was revealed through scenario-based testing. So we might expect that you know, bugs in certain components with certain symptoms might be more easily revealed through scenario-based testing and we might notice that scenario-based testing just isn't a feasible strategy um, for other types of bugs. And um, we might also be interested in what the interaction was between bug type and scenario selection strategy. So if there is an interaction, then we would notice that you know, bug types, uh, certain bugs are easier to identify under certain scenario selection strategies. And Finally, we might wonder which test oracles are most effective at identifying uh, bugs. These are all important questions for you know, the field of scenario-based testing and gaining confidence in autonomous vehicles and maybe even cyber physical systems generally. Um, so ultimately the outcomes of this study would allow us to achieve a better understanding of the e efficacy of scenario-based testing and also to develop this benchmark for evaluating scenario-based testing strategies in a unified way. So rather than having the, these ad hoc um, evaluations that aren't you know, easily comparable, we have this one framework from which we can evaluate future strategies. And yeah, that's everything. Thanks. Awesome, what a great way to end. Thank you. Any questions? Mine was about the amount of data. Uh, you seem to want to test a bunch of correlations and even interactions. And the more things you want to test, the more data you need to be able to estimate these models and so on. So I uh, was wondering if you have enough data to be able to do this. Um, yeah, I think that we, so we're, so since, since the amount of bugs, of historical bugs that we have access to that, you know, result in behavioral differences is somewhat low, we have like, you know, 10, maybe 20. Um, we're really relying on um, these artificial bugs. And so kind of a core uh, mm -hmm. assumption is that the artificial bugs will have some similarity to the historical bugs and give us some information. Mm -hmm. um, so it might be the case that, you know, the artificial bugs just aren't helpful and then we have to deal with 20 bugs and we, we might be limited in the kinds of quantitative analysis that we can do. Great. Thank you. I guess we are really at the end then. Um, I want to thank you again for everything you've done this semester and for being so engaging and, and thoughtful and, and so on. And I look forward to reading your final reports and otherwise to seeing you in person soon. Thanks, Brandon. Thank you. All the best for me. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.